I'm Brandi Carlisle. And I'm Margot Price. And you're watching Billboard. So, Margot, do you remember where we first met? Okay, um, it was on tour. You yeah. asked me to open for you. And I think it was Buffalo, New York. That's right, at Ani's yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. it was like a, almost like a church. Yeah. That was refurbished. It was really yeah, fun Yeah, super tour. vibey. And yeah. we had a whiskey afterwards, and we started talking about starting a super group. That's right. Yeah. We were definitely drinking whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a good time. Um, what was your reaction when you found out about your Grammy nomination? Well, first of all, I'm on the West Coast, so I was asleep. Yeah. And um, my publicist and my friend Asha called and woke me up at about 5.31 a.m. And I just couldn't even get my head around it. And it was still unfolding at that point. We only knew about two of the six. And then, and then Greg Nadell called me and told me about the third. And then I walked into the bedroom. My wife was shaking her head, telling me that it was six. And I just, it was like a dream. <laughs> I just started calling the twins, you know. That's but crazy. I guess my reaction was a strange um, exuberance, just joy. I just felt yeah. such joy and a strange relief that some of the work that I've put in for all these years had been seen. Totally. Yeah. How about you? What was your reaction? Um, I was actually on the West Coast, too. And so I was okay, asleep, so you were asleep. And, and my phone started blowing up and... Uh, my gut reaction was that somebody had died. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> because, what I thought, too. I thought it was bad news. Um, so then um, my husband kind of heard me stirring, and he was like, what's going on? I'm like, I got nominated for a Grammy, but I think we need to get more sleep. <laughs> but then we laid there, and we couldn't go back to bed. So yeah. I got up and uh, called my mom. Right on, man. It's <laughs> awesome. It is, it's such a strange thing, isn't it? Yeah. People that say they don't care, they're just lying, man. You care. It was, uh, yeah, it was pretty fun. <laughs> What's the biggest challenge you faced in the in industry to get where you are now? Oh, the biggest challenge. Um, I don't know. There's been, <laughs> there's been quite a few on the way. I think um, the business side of things for a really long time was hard for me to navigate. It was hard for me to know who to trust. And in my early days, I signed this couple bad uh, album deals. I had a couple publicists that took my money and ran. Uh, I don't know. What, what, what have been yours? I've had such um, ups and downs, but I've had such a nice time doing my job, you know, since I was a little kid. It's all I ever wanted to do. But I will say that I learned right away that if I wanted my voice to be heard in the room, I'd have to ask one of my guys to say it. And slowly over the years, that just got older and older until I started really wanting, um, really wanting people to hear my voice and my ideas and, and to take the things I was thinking seriously without me having to ask a member of my band or a, a male producer or executive to deliver exactly. that idea for me. So just, just my voice being heard as a woman has been a battle, and I think that we're in, the, in a crux of a tipping point right now and right. really maybe seeing that change for real for the first time. Not baby steps, but radical leap. Yeah. I had, um, when, when we first started touring, I wanted to, uh, you know, book things myself. I didn't have management, I didn't have booking, so I created a manager, and his name was John Sirota, and I emailed everybody as John. From John I, Sirota? Yeah, it was a uh, Did you give him a British a accent? Way. Because that would be... Even more. Well, I didn't do his talking, but I would have, a, you know, if any problem went wrong, we would just blame it on this man who didn't exist, and then my husband would get on the phone and pretend to be him. But That's genius. Yeah, re uh, way better reaction for, you know, booking your own shows when it came from somebody else. And yeah. I thought, well, I'm not going to have it be a woman's name. I'm going to have it be a man's name. So how do you think we can use our artistry to bring about positive change in the world? It's such a good question. Um, you know, it's something that I've wanted to do from the moment I started singing. I think, you know, hopefully it opened people's minds that maybe would not normally have an understanding of something. Um, and I think especially, you know, in the country genre, 
It's been a challenge for me to talk about issues like the pay gap and gun but control and, you know, women's rights. Um, but definitely, I think you've done a great job this year. You with, always have talked about it. I always say, and anybody that asks me, I say, yeah, Margot Price committed country music suicide <laughs> many times. <laughs> You know, someone's got to do it. <laughs> I've always admired that so much about you, even more than your music, which I love, is that you continue to do that over and over again. And it Thanks. it meant that you didn't have maybe immediate no-brainer commercial country music success, but you're on the right side of history, and that shit doesn't go away. Yeah, I think we're really at a, a turning point in yeah. our country right now, too, with yeah. everything that's going on. I, what I want to do is, you know, now turn those things more into action and you've done such a great job this year of you know with everything with War Child UK and and which you I was so of, happy to well, be a part been ahead of, of, of cover stories. Those. You were even ahead of the election and I think woke before a lot of us country singers were. So it was a it was a hard thing for people to talk about because you know I think nobody wanted to lose fans and you've got publicists saying, you know, don't talk about politics, but mm -hmm. it it feels kind of like we're at a you know at a turning point like music was in the 60s and the 70s and that was always the kind of stuff that really influenced me to Bob Dylan and Neil Young and people that could put it into a song without coming off I don't know in a cheesy way it's hard to write a good political song it's true I think my favorite political writer is probably still Buffy St. Marie oh she's so and, good and I have to say Kendrick Lamar too I yeah. think he's our protest writer yeah. for our generation for sure yeah. Um, I always say whenever anybody asks me this question that the best advice I can give to young people, women, LGBTQ people, anybody on the margins, any of the misfit toys, is to align yourself and assimilate with a community mm -hmm. and take on these problems together with yeah. many other people. Because nothing has ever changed in this country, and in fact nothing's ever changed in the world without a scene. Yeah, we have to make a scene, and I think that that's um, that's the takeaway from the civil rights movement. That's the takeaway from the protesting the Vietnam War, and that's the takeaway right now from protesting the state of the country that we live in. Is getting together as a community, making a scene, safety in numbers, and and certainly impact in numbers. For sure. Yeah.